Hello, welcome. My name's Dr. Stephen Stoltz and I'm from La Trobe University in Australia and today I have with me Professor Lawrence Shapiro from the University of Wisconsin-Madison from the United States of America. Uh, Larry right now is with me at the moment as a visiting scholar to La Trobe University and so welcome. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the Department of Education and La Trobe University for having me here. Um, thank you for taking the invitation to, to be here. I appreciate it. I, look, I wanted to take the opportunity to um, ask Larry a few questions. Uh, Larry is an um, international scholar from the uh, emerging discipline area of embodied cognition, and so this presents a perfect opportunity to kind of uh, ask a few questions about embodied cognition. So let's get started. So, Larry, what's embodied cognition? Body cognition is a relatively recent program in psychology that shifts focus from uh, disembodied cognitive processes to um, the thought that the body is somehow deeply integrated into cognition. Sure. And in the literature, when you do read some of the literature, um, my understanding is that there, there is a broad understanding of what embodied cognition and if you like no general consensus concerning what embodied cognition is. So what so why is that? Well part of it is because of the broad range of topics that's covered in embodied cognition. Sure. Researchers might study learning, perception, attention, memory, mm -hmm. language comprehension and along with this broad range of topics there are a broad range of disciplines focusing on these things. Computer science, robotics, artificial intelligence, psychology, philosophy. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to imagine a unified approach given all these different disciplines that are coming at it. Sure. And so, uh, I know we've talked a little bit about this, um, and again, it is uh, mentioned by different scholars, but the idea that embodied cognition is meant to be an alternative, if you, if you like, to the traditional cognitive approaches to cognition or cognitivism as we know it. Um, why is that? Why is it considered to be a challenge? Well, for many decades, since the 1950s probably, uh, cognition has been viewed as a sort of computational process going on in the brain. And what embodied cognition emphasizes is the brain and, uh, sorry, the body and interaction with the environment. Mm. The brain certainly plays a role still, but uh, they minimize or uh, diminish the role of the brain in cognitive processing. Mm. Sure, I can imagine that would be quite challenging for people who have had invested interest or research in cognitive science for a long time. So. I know. Um, so I know. Just recently, you went to a philosophy of science conference. How are you? How would, and uh, with your colleagues from the cognitive science kind of uh, area, how do they normally treat your presence um, when they know you're, if you like, have a particular research interest in embodied cognition? Well, a lot of researchers, psychologists, and others doing empirical work are are happy to have a philosopher along to ask questions about the conceptual foundations of what they're doing and mm -hmm. their interpretations of the data. And of course, there are others who might hold their nose a bit when the philosopher's in town sure. because uh, they um, they look at us with suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> I could say something there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Next question: Why? Um, so, what support or evidence do you have for embodied cognition? I'm sure there's a lot of people watching this wondering that. So, that's a logical question to ask. So, yeah, there's a lot of support coming from uh, experimental procedures in psychology where uh, these psychologists will. Uh, ask subjects to perform some sort of task uh, and then by uh, making manipulations on their bodies in certain ways they mm. find that the subjects differ in their results depending on simple facts even such as whether they're right or left-handed. Mm. And then there's also work in robotics where uh, robots have been designed that seem to perform sophisticated sorts of behavior like navigating through a room but do so in a way that uh, um, doesn't rely on the sort of computationalism that once was thought to mm. be the only way to solve these problems. Yes, yes. So just recently, um, Larry just did a research seminar um, and the title of the research uh, presentation was uh, Embodied Cognition Lessons from Linguistic Determinism. And, uh, um, and that was a very interesting presentation because it was a, if you like, a reconsideration or if you like a, a reconceptualization based on obviously scientific or empirical scientific work to say that hang on the idea that uh, we go from mind to body is actually not necessarily the case. Um, we need to reconsider that and think about how the body, if you like, influences the mind. So That's right. Yeah, so um, I found that very interesting and I think that's a, probably another example of <laughs> how yeah. some of that evidence kind of works in the favour of embodied cognition. All right, let's move on. Let's have a look at some of this literature here. Do you want to just have a, 
a quick um, discussion about, for those who might be interested in body cognition, what's worthwhile having a look at. I, um, did you want to mention something about your book here from the 20? Yeah, so, uh, so I, I wrote a book published in 2011, which is intended to provide an entryway to people interested in the topic. Uh, what I do in that book is I divide the literature and the questions that uh, are of interest in embodied cognition mm -hmm. into three broad categories and try to explain what these uh, categories are and what support there might be for the themes within each category. So I, I think my book is actually a, a nice place to introduce yourself. Sure. Sure. to the topic. And I know in particular talk about those three broad themes as replacement, uh, constitution and conceptualization. Mm -hmm. Did you want to just um, speak very briefly about each one of those, how they interrelate and overlap and support um, each other? Yeah, sure. The theme of replacement um, is uh, in involves work that tries to show that rather than relying on computational processes to um, perform certain tasks we can actually replace the computational processes by focusing on body environment interactions. Uh, so uh, in, in, in this field, you'll see work that tries to show that motor control of the leg, say, that used to be thought to be under computational sort of instructions is in fact uh, just a process of uh, legs working like springs in, in an environment. Um, topic of conceptualization involves how the properties of bodies constrain or restrict the ways that you think about the world. And so one prediction of this school of thought is that if you and uh, say an extraterrestrial with a body very different from yours uh, were to look at the world, you would see different things, understand it in different ways, just in virtue of your differences in body. Mm -hmm. And the final um, program I look at, I call constitution. And here the idea is that the body or actually even pieces of the world might be constituents in a cognitive process itself. Mm -hmm. And and I guess last question really, I know I haven't listed it here, but we've done a bit of work, if you like, around application of embodied cognition, in, obviously in this case, um, education. Just tell us a bit more where you see maybe some of the application could possibly be used in embodied cognition, maybe from an educational point of view, because that's what we've been talking about whilst you've been here. Sure. Well, one uh, area sort of rich in application is this field known as situated cognition, where the idea here is that rather than trying to teach students abstract principles, yeah. um, you should situate them in an environment in which they're able to manipulate pieces of the environment and gain knowledge in that sort of way. Mm. So the knowledge comes in the form of interactions with the environment rather mm. than the uh, memorization of abstract principles. Mm. Uh, another field um, that invites further study uh, involves research on gestures. We gesture when we speak, and mm. it turns out gesturing uh, is an important component of thought itself. Mm. And if we can realize when we're speaking to students that they are communicating with their gestures, we have an additional way to access what they're thinking. Mm. And so another tool for instructing them. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I was gonna say, I was, if, I was gonna ask you about just if you didn't bring it up because mm -hmm. I know that's something we've been looking at. Yeah. And is, and is, is an area ripe for further research. Um, Definitely. Um, in particular, the connections with embodied cognition and what it can do, if you like, in an educational context. Certainly, yeah. Look, we might leave it there, but thank you for the opportunity to ask you some questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, th and thank you for coming to La Trobe as a visiting scholar. Thanks for having me, I really enjoyed it. <laughs>